Good morning and welcome to London Area Christian Church where we're here to love one more. So glad you chose to join us this morning as we gather together to worship our great God. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, I encourage you to fill out our online connect card that can be found at our website, LondonAreaChristianChurch.com and click connect. For each person that fills out a connect card, we're going to give $5 away to Operation Christmas Child, which is the Ministry of Samaritan's Purse that sends uh, Christmas gifts to kids across the world. So uh, if you fill out the card, we'll give 5 bucks away to them. Also, uh, for the month of July, uh, we are participating in Operation Christmas Child. So as you came in, under the table in the lobby are pre-wrapped gift boxes. So if you would like to participate in Operation Christmas Child, take a box, take one of the little tags uh, for what age and uh, gender of child that you're going to buy gifts for for that box and there's instructions as well on top of it take that with you uh, bring it back by the end of july so we can have that ready to give your operation christmas child for christmas uh, so they can send out those boxes to kids around the world so i'd appreciate if you could uh, participate in that as well also, if you haven't done so, please like our church Facebook page, facebook.com slash London Area Christian Church. It's where you can find out about what events we have going on, where you can watch our live streams if you're not able to be with us in person, and where you can just continue to interact with us and um, uh, be a part of the community on Facebook. Also, an update on where we are in our COVID-19 Back to Normal plan. We are still in Phase 3 of our Back to Normal plan, uh, so that means we're asking as you come in, please wear a mask, and, and as you exit, wear a mask. Once you're sitting in your seat, you can take it off. Uh, we have um, some snacks and coffee out in the lobby for after service. Um, our seats are now uh, three feet apart versus six feet apart. We're having our kids' classes again at 9.30. Uh, so for the summer, our, our 9.30 uh, kids' class is going on, so kids can come to that for our 9.30 service. Uh, and so as we get closer to phase four, which will be basically back to normal, no masks, no distancing, we're going to go on with life uh, as we hope it will be. Uh, as we get closer to that point, we will let you know when it looks like we're going to be shifting from phase three to phase four uh, so you can be ready and also so that we can celebrate when that happens and hopefully have a nice celebration for being back to normal and life continuing uh, moving forward. So in a few moments, we're going to sing some songs together, then we're going to study God's Word together, and later in our service, we're going to have a time to remember what Jesus has done for us through His death, burial, and resurrection. So if you're watching from home, you can go ahead and grab a piece of bread or a cracker, tortilla, some water juice and milk, and save those for later. If you're here with us in the building, hopefully you grabbed a communion cup on your way in. If not, there's still time to grab one out in the lobby. Also, as you leave today, uh, the giving box is placed by the, the double doors. So as you leave, uh, you can place your giving in the giving box, or you can continue to give on our church website or set up online giving uh, through your bank as well. Today we're starting a new series called Shape, and we're exploring uh, how we're being shaped, how there are different things that are working in our lives that are all working to shape us and form us in different ways, and we need to discover what those are and how we're being shaped by them. So if you would, please say our theme verse for this series. Uh, this is our, our verse for the series. Uh, if, you would, if you would, please say it with me. And we all, who with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that You're with us on our journey following Jesus. May Your Word and Your Spirit continue to be at work in us, transforming us as we gather together around Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Dave. Um, guys, my name is Matt. I'm filling in for Mark this morning, who is uh, out of town. And we are joined by Adam over on bass, Hannah and Mel uh, singing vocals for us this morning, and Hunter on drums. And I would just invite all of you guys to stand and sing um, as we uh, partner together to worship our great God this morning.
through every chain of the past You're broken into over fears, over lies We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible
you so much for who you are, for how you love us, God. Thank you, God, that you are our rescuer, God, that you have sent Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for us, God, to atone us back to, into right relationship with you. God, thank you so much that you love your kids enough to rescue them from their sin, from their past, God, from all the imperfections in our life, God, that keep us from you. So, God, thank you. God, transform us through Dave's message, through your message, through Dave this morning. God, transform us, make us more into the perfect image of your son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. You can have a seat. Good morning. Good morning. Hey. My name is Dave. I'm the preaching pastor here at London Area Christian Church. So we dive in this morning. I want to take a few minutes to talk to our kids who are uh, watching from home. So, how many of you know what this might be? It's Play-Doh, right? We all love Play-Doh. It smells so good. You can make awesome stuff with it. All right, so here you go. Here's, I'm going to show you one of the, my best creations of Play-Doh. Here, here's the first one. Snake, snake. It's a snake, right. Okay, good. Here we go. Next one. It's a worm. Here you go, one more. All right, I'm really good at this. It's an orange hot dog. <laughs> a caterpillar. Or a carrot. <laughs> if you're good with Play-Doh, you can make Play-Doh all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, you can roll it out, you can shape it, you can press it, you can mold it and make it, make all kinds of awesome stuff. And the Bible says that we are like Play-Doh. The Bible says that God is the potter and we are the clay. Clay is like, like a substance like Play-Doh that you can mold and make into stuff. And the Bible says that God is the one who molds us and shapes us, that we are like clay in his hands. He's always molding and shaping us. And so we're going to talk about, over the next few weeks, how God is at work shaping us, or how other things in our lives can shape us, and how we want to let God shape us and not let other things shape us. And so we want to allow God to be at work making us into who he wants to be. And God's way better at molding us than I am. He does better. He's got a lot more he can make than worms and snakes and hot dogs. And so we will let God work in us. So uh, thanks for listening, guys. And uh, we can, we're can we going to continue on as we continue to dive into God's word today. A few weeks ago, uh, I started watching a, a new show on Netflix. I had finished up one series and was looking for something else to watch when I had time that I didn't want to do other things. And so I found this show. It pops up and says, like, check this out. And so it was a show called Forged in Fire. So it's a competition show where each show basically goes with you have four bladesmiths who come to the forge. And they are uh, shown what they're going to make, what kind of knife they're going to make, and then what, kind, what metal they're going to use. And so uh, they have different episodes where they come in and they're given like a bar of steel that they have to heat up and... and and shape to make the blade they're going to make. Uh, one episode they came in, there's a table that had uh, j jars of old fish hooks and old bike chains and old gears and old ball bearings. And they had to use all that stuff to make a solid piece of metal that they could make a, a blade out of. And I, I just find this show really fascinating that they can show you this intricate knife and that the blades just have to look at it or go up and, and measure it and then take a metal and heat it up and then take it to the anvil and like pound on it. Or they have this thing called Big Blue, which is a power hammer, and they push the pedal and that pounds it for them on an anvil. But they, can, they have this image in their head and they know by heating and pounding, heating and pounding, heating and pounding, that they can eventually get the shape they want. I'm just like, that's amazing how someone can have the knowledge uh, to take this, just like a bunch of ball bearings, and how to properly weld them together so they can make this solid piece of steel to make a knife strong enough to withstand some pretty wicked tests they put them through. And I just this show, as I'm thinking about, it, like like this is a lot like us, that we're like these pieces of metal that we're constantly being heated up and pounded on that we're being heated and pounded, that we're constantly being shaped into some kind of image. And the Bible tells us that that image is meant to be become like Jesus. And so we've been looking at, for the, for the last few weeks, we looked at how do we live wisely? 
And this series we're starting today is kind of is continuing that. So if we want to live wisely, well, we looked at some different areas of our lives and how to live wisely in relation to those things. But now we're going to look at if we want to be wise in how we live, we also need to be aware of how we're being shaped. That the reality is all of us all the time are being shaped by things. We're being shaped uh, by uh, different things in our lives. And so we're constantly and consistently being shaped. And so we want to discover how we're being shaped. And here's the big idea for this entire series. We are being shaped either consciously or unconsciously. That, that we are, we're being shaped all the time and either we know it or we don't. And whether we know it or not, we are being shaped. And so we need to become aware of how we're being shaped so that we can be active in deciding, is that how I want to be shaped? That we're being shaped by our culture. We're being shaped by our relationships. We're being shaped by our politics. We are being shaped by religion. We are shaped by the books we read, the movies and TV shows we watch. We're being shaped by the music we listen to, the commercials we see. We're being shaped by the people we talk to and the experiences we have. We are constantly being shaped. And the danger is, is if we're being shaped unknowingly or uncritically. And so to live wisely, we need to discern how we're being shaped and decide if that's how we want to be shaped. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, our, our verse for this series. It says, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Paul here says that all of us, if we are believers and followers in Jesus, we are being shaped, we're being transformed as we focus on Jesus. As we focus on Jesus, we are being transformed or shaped into his image. That's our goal as followers of Jesus. We want the shaping that's taking place in our life to do at the end of the day, when, 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 when we're fully shaped, we want to look like Jesus. And so we're going to look at different areas of our lives that are at work shaping us. And we're going to try to examine them critically of are they helping me to be shaped like Jesus or not. And so today, we're going to look at an area of our lives that shapes us. Since it's the 4th of July, and I hope everybody wore their uh, steel-toed boots, because the goal is to step on everybody's toes today. We're going to examine how politics shapes us. So we're looking at how, how politics is at work shaping us. And so politics tells a story that shapes us. So it doesn't matter which side of the political spectrum or where along the political spectrum you identify. If you find yourself more on the left or more on the right, more in the middle, more in the I don't care. Like it doesn't matter where you are. Each side, or our, our American politics, all tell some variation of these stories. And these stories shape us, whether we know it or not. They're a part of our, our, our cultural, political world. And so we need to be aware of them and how they're shaping us. And so some of this information came from a book called The Liturgy of Politics by Caitlin Scheiss. And so I, I listened to an interview that she did on the Holy Post podcast with Phil Vischer, the creator of VeggieTales, and Sky Jatani, a pastor, author, and speaker. And she identifies four stories, or she calls them gospels, that politics tells us. So we're going to examine those and see how they could be shaping us and how they fit with the biblical story. So the first one is the story of prosperity. The story of prosperity. Now this story it may be so familiar to us, it's so ingrained in our culture that we may not even be aware of it. This story goes something like this. It's the story of a hardworking and disturbing person who gains success by beating the system or earning the favor of someone powerful. So an example would be this. There's a dad with a young son 
who is struggling to make ends meet. He's got a job and he's not he's okay at it, but he's not making enough money. And so he has the opportunity to be an unpaid intern at a stock brokerage. But it, he's not alone. There, there are 20 other interns who are all younger than he is. And one of them is going to earn a full-time position. So he, he gets the internship. He starts working hard at it. But in the midst of this, he's evicted from his apartment. So he and his son become homeless. And in the midst of that, his wife leaves him. But he works hard. And eventually, at the end of it, he earns the full-time position. And he goes on to eventually starting his own multi-million dollar stock brokerage. Now you may have heard that story before. It, it was uh, depicted in the movie, uh, The Pursuit of Happiness, with Will Smith, the story of Chris Gardner. True story. And it's a story, that, and that's the American dream, the American rags to riches stories. Like it's, in, in, it's all over the place. Like in our TV shows, our movies, our books... We love this story of someone who starts out with nothing, works really, really, really hard, overcomes obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, so they become a success, and they're like super rich, and we're like, yeah, you did it. And we have this story that tells us our goal is to become prosperous. And we've attached to that, whether we realize it or not, a moral rightness that those who prosper, they're morally right. Or, to put it in a, a, a more Christian way, that God has blessed them. If you're rich, it's because God's blessed you. Now, the other side of it that we don't always talk about is that means if you're poor, then God hasn't blessed you. And so we have this story of prosperity that's shaping us. And it, it, it's, a, it's a part of our American political system that, that each side tells a story in a little different way. One side may say that what people need to prosper, they need freedom. So if you work hard and we remove any constraints from you, then you can work hard and you will, you will succeed and you will become prosperous. Because we live in this, this capitalistic world, free market, let, let you go run wild as an entrepreneur. You can do it. You'll, you'll prosper. The other side will say, well, well uh, there are certain inherent obstacles that some people can't overcome. And so we need to, the government needs to intervene to help lift them up to a place where they have equal footing. And then once they've been helped, They've got the little, kind of like that, that head start push. Then they can go off and they can, they can prosper. Both sides, though, are saying that the end goal is prosperity. And once you've prospered, that's a sign that God has favored you, blessed you. And this story, it, it shapes us. It's part of our, our American political ideas that we think that the goal of life is to be prosperous, to be rich. And yet that doesn't fit in the full way with the biblical story. And like each of these stories we're going to look at have elements of truth. The Bible tells us that we should work hard for sure. Like the Bible does not condone you to be lazy. That's not biblical thinking. But the Bible doesn't tell us to pursue prosperity. Look at what the biblical story says in Proverbs chapter 30, starting in verse 7. It says, Two things I ask of you, Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal, and so dishonor the name of my God. He says, two things I want, God. One, keep me from lying. And two, don't make me rich, so I say I don't need you. And don't make me poor, so I have to steal. Instead, give me what I need. See, the biblical story doesn't call us to pursue prosperity. It calls us to pursue uh, biblical contentment that's based on divine providence. 
See, Jesus' prayer was, give us today our daily bread. That what we need to, to pursue is not being prosperous, not having riches, but to have what we need for today so we can trust God for tomorrow. And, we, and, and, and in our world, like mo, probably most of us, if not all of us, we don't live in that place. I've got a freezer filled with food at home. I have money in my savings account. I've got enough, uh, tomorrow, I've got more than enough for tomorrow. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be wise, that wisdom is, yes, to save, wisdom is to, to be ready, but we need to figure out where's the line of being wise and where's the part of I'm trying to fully protect myself so I don't have to rely on God. And so we need to figure out how do we live in this contented place if I have what I need. And I'm going to trust God for what is coming. And so this, this story of prosperity tries to tell us that, well, you have to be prosperous. And yet the biblical story calls us to something different. Uh, the next story that our politics tells us or uses to shape us is a story of patriotism. And today is the 4th of July. It's our Independence Day. And I may say some things now. That could be a bit uncomfortable, but I want to preface that by saying, I love our country. I'm proud to live in America. That I recognize that we live in the freest country in the history of the world. But, there are some things that go along with the story of patriotism that we need to examine and recognize those aren't true with the biblical story. So, the story of patriotism says something like this. America is a special nation chosen by God and ordained by God to be a light to the world because America is the greatest nation to ever exist and we should give full and total allegiance to America. Patriotism says America is the best and the greatest and chosen by God to be that way. There's some problems with that. So a few years ago, a Hurricane Katrina hit, decimated New Orleans. And I saw a guy on TV later who was talking about what happened. And said that it was God punishing America for our sins. Because God had given the promises of Israel to America. And I was like, mm, no. Sorry. Not the case. That if we say that America is divinely chosen by God, that's not what the biblical story says. The biblical story, God made certain promises to Israel. And if they are carried forward, they don't apply to America, they apply to the church, which is God's people who exist in every nation, in every country, across the world. That to be a light to the world is not the calling of America, it's the calling of the church. And so we're called to be God's light wherever He takes us. And yes, I want America to be great. I want us to do good and great things. And I recognize we've done good and great things in the past. Fighting against Hitler in World War II was a great good that America participated in. Uh, spreading democracy and freedom around the world is a good thing. But we also need to recognize and be willing to admit that our country has also done some really bad things in the past. But it took us almost 200 years to fulfill our founding ideal that all men are created equal. That it took until the, the 60s that we started recognizing that all people, all races, are equal. And we still are working through some of those things today in our world. And those are important conversations still to have. How can we treat each other with love and respect and see each other as all made in God's image? Those are important things. And we need to recognize that our history as a country 
has some trouble spots. Now, that does not mean that we should hate our country. Again, I am proud that God has placed me to live in the freest country in the world. Like, if I had to pick anywhere else to live, I'm going to pick America because we, I can preach God's word. I can celebrate who God is without fear of the government telling me not to do that. And so we can be proud of the good things of our country while also recognizing there are parts that aren't so good. And the story of patriotism wants us to give our full allegiance to America. And if you're a follower of Jesus, that's not what we're called to. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. It says, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I've often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but... Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies, as they will be like His glorious body. Paul says that our citizenship is in heaven, that our first and foremost allegiance, our primary citizenship, is not America. It's God's kingdom. So while I can be proud for the good of America, I can be honest about the bad of America, if there is a conflict between my American citizenship and that of King Jesus, King Jesus has to win every time. Because my primary citizenship is not to a sovereign nation, is to a sovereign king who reigns over all things. And so I need to be willing to put his kingdom first and to live in a way that brings his kingdom to earth and recognize that my loyalties have shifted from hearth and home and nation to the kingdom of Jesus. That I'm now part of a global family of every tongue, every tribe, every nation. That when we are in the new creation, it's going to be the, the, the biggest greatest multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual worship service ever. And that's the, the glory of what God's bringing us to. And so if my allegiance to a country gets in the way of that, then I need to let that go and stay primary focused on His kingdom. And so that story is shaping us, trying to tell us where our allegiance lies. And the biblical story says something different. The next story that our politics uses to shape us is the story of security. Last year, as the COVID-19 pandemic was beginning, I was hit in the face with this story. That I became incredibly anxious and scared over am I going to stay safe and can I keep my family safe from this own unknown virus that's, that's out there that I don't know who has it and who doesn't, where it's at, and it's going to get me. And how am I going to keep my people safe? How am I going to keep our church safe? And I realized that God doesn't care as much about my safety as I do. And I had to wrestle through that, that God does not promise to keep me safe. And so this story of security is about how we should do things to keep our safe and that we prioritize our safety and security over that of others. And so if my safety trumps your safety, well, that's your problem. Because i got to be kept safe. And we can do this both on an individual sense where we worry about my rights, my needs over yours, and as a, as a, as a, as a nation. Last year, fiscal year 2020, America spent $714 billion on defense. That's 10% of our federal budget, 45% of our discretionary spending is on defense. And, and there's one part of that that's, that's, that's good. Like a, a nation, part of a, the contract between 
a citizen and its nation is that they will protect us. And so they have military, uh, people who serve, who their job is to protect our country. And they're, that's great. We need that. Just like at a local level, uh, we pay taxes to our, our local town so they can employ fire department and police department whose job should be to protect its citizens. Just like our military protects us on a global international level. But there's an argument that you can be made about how much spending should we do on those things. But just that's just the reality is that's what we spend. We place a high priority in both wherever you fall on the political spectrum on defending ourselves because we believe that we should be kept secure. And part of what that means is that, that we should be kept secure so that we don't go through suffering. So we should avoid pain. And, and this, this story finds itself in the church, where we need to do things that avoid pain. And if we go through painful things, it's because God is punishing us, or is mad at us, or he's not with us. And yet that's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible instead says in James chapter 1, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, that whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That suffering is true for all of us. That God does not promise to always protect us. Instead, God promises to always be with us. Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart I've overcome the world. That we will go through difficult things. We'll not always be kept safe and secure. And so we need to trust God through those things. The next story that our politics will use to shape us is the story of supremacy. And that story says, I'm better than you. Whatever side, whatever divide, or whatever the thing or issue is, the story of supremacy says that whatever side you're on is the right side. And those who oppose you are wrong. They're worse than you. And, and we even go so far to say they're our enemies. And this is all over. I mean, you think about our current political situation and the divide we see politically. If you watch cable news, or listen to political podcasts, or, or read political blogs or information, you will hear, or if, you're, if you engage politically on social media, you'll hear one side talk about the other side. And we'll, we'll use words that insult their intelligence, that insult their um, parental upbringing, that insult their behavior, that insult who they are, that we use words to dehumanize, devalue, and demonize the other side. Well, it doesn't matter what side you're on. We, we all do it to each other. Because we've bought into this story that my side's right, and therefore I'm better than you. And so I can call you names because I'm better than you. I can devalue you. And this is true in our politics and things that divide us. It's true. I find this true when it comes to matters of faith. And I've recognized. See, I believe 100% that Jesus is the Son of God, sent by God to die for us, who uh, was buried, came back to life, and now is sitting at the right hand of the Father, ruling over all things. I believe His words when He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I believe that is 100% true. There is no way to be saved except through Jesus. And there are people in our community, in our country, in our world, who believe differently. They're part of other faith traditions that don't believe Jesus is divine, that don't believe he's the way to be saved. And I have a choice. 
I can choose to, to grab hold of the, the story of supremacy and say, well, I'm better than you because I know the way to be safe and you don't. And I can use words to devalue, dehumanize, or demonize them. But all that's going to do is continue the fight. Instead, I'm trying to learn to recognize that they are people made in God's image, loved by God, who God desperately wants to surrender their life to Jesus and begin a journey following him. And so I've got to recognize, how do I interact with those of a different faith? How can I disagree on whatever we disagree about in a way that's, that's uh, not disagreeable, but that is civil and loving and kind so that I can show them the self-giving self love of Jesus? How can I help and be a benefit to people of other faiths, other thought processes, other political ideologies? How can I be someone that's a help and benefit who lays down my rights to love them so they can discover the life-changing love of Jesus? That the gospel or the story of supremacy says I'm better, yet Jesus calls me to take the way of love and self-sacrifice. And how can I love someone else by showing them God's love. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. So, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you are a part of the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter what side of the political uh, spectrum you're on. It doesn't matter what you look like, what you talk like, where you've been, what you've done. If you are a follower of Jesus, we are all part of one kingdom, one family. Last week we had a great week doing VBS with Orchard Christian Fellowship, another, another church in town. And we are not in competition with them because we are on the same team. We're the same family, same kingdom. I want them to succeed and reach people for Christ just like we want to succeed and reach people for Christ. If every church in town has to build new buildings because we have more people coming to Jesus, that's a win for the kingdom and not a loss for anybody. We're all one family. And so we're not competing. The Bible goes on in Genesis 1. It says, God said, let us make mankind in our image. And our likeness. So they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The story of supremacy says, I am better. The biblical story says, we are all made in the image of God. Every person. So I'm not better than somebody else. I may have different ideas. I may have a different knowledge. I may have a different life experience. But that doesn't make me better. That we are all God's people. Made by him. And God wants every single person to be saved. And to come to a knowledge of Jesus. And so these stories. These political stories of prosperity. And patriotism. And security and supremacy all are a part of our world. And they're things we hear, things we're taught, things we believe, and they're all at work shaping us. And as followers of Jesus, we need to be able to discern what these stories are and how they're affecting us. And how do they relate to the biblical story. And so our goal of this series is that we will all be able to pay attention to how we're being shaped that we can see how these forces in our lives are trying to shape us and how can we let Jesus shape us in the midst of these so that we become more like him and not like something else. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are at work in us to shape us and to make us like Jesus. God, we thank you for your love. God, we thank you for how you are at work in us. And so, Father, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and minds to understand how uh, these stories, uh, these forces, how politics and other things in our world are at work shaping us. So, God, help us to be critical, to think 
uh, critically about them and to see what is true and what is false and, and how these things are working to shape us. And God, help us to surrender most of all to you that as we focus on Jesus, that you would shape us to become more and more like him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dave. As we respond to uh, God's message through Dave uh, this morning, I would invite you to stand and sing with us as Mel's going to lead us in a song called What a Beautiful Day. What a
have no rival. You have no equal. Jesus has no rival. He has no equal. Not because he came and conquered through power and might, not because he demonized or dehumanized or devalued his enemies, not because he got his way and said, my rights over yours. Jesus has no rival. He has no equal. Well, as he did, came and did the unthinkable, he who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess, that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That Jesus has no rival. He has no equal. Because he came down, gave up his rights, and went to a cross to give up his life for us. To show us the way is not in a power story but in self-sacrifice and in doing so he provides salvation for all who call on his name and so we have this moment every week to pause and remember what our king has done that he has no rival he has the equal because he gave up his life for us. If you're watching from home, you can grab your piece of cracker or tortilla, a piece of bread. If you're here in the building with us, you can open up the top of the communion cup to the bread. And this bread symbolizes for us the body of Christ that's been broken for us for all people, so we can be saved. Let's take it together. In the same way, if you're watching from home, you can grab your uh, juice, water, and milk, whatever you have. If you're here in the building with us, you can open up uh, the foil to the juice. And this juice represents for us the blood of Christ that was poured out for us to forgive our sins and to provide salvation. Let's take it together. As our time together draws to a close, I want to say thank you again for joining us today as we celebrate what God's doing in our lives. A few reminders, if it's your first time connecting with us, I encourage you to please fill out our online connect card that can be found at our church website, lenarychristianchurch.com, and click connect. Uh, also, if you want to participate in Operation Christmas Child, as you leave, there are pre-wrapped boxes out under the table in the lobby. Uh, grab uh, some instructions on what to fill the boxes with and a tag to put on it when you bring it back. And bring that back at the end of July so we can have those ready to be sent out uh, to kids around the world. Let's pray a prayer of blessing as we go out our, uh, in God's power this week. Uh, Father, we thank you that you're with us on our journey. God, help us to, to discern how we're being shaped by the stories we believe. And God, help us to have eyes to see, ears to hear, and minds to understand how we're being shaped and to continually seek to be shaped by your story and by your son. So it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Have a great week and keep finding ways to love one more.